Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that if you're someone who has a really great sense of direction, even in places that you've only been once before, it means that you have different nerve cells in your hippocampus, and those are activated by different locations. So your brain is basically drawing a map of where you are through your nerve cells. They just discovered these cells, and they're called grid cells. And they are almost exactly like a GPS for your brain. And they're often impacted when you have a stroke or Alzheimer's. And the cool thing is they're actually laid out in hexagons. There's a big hexagon, there's a medium-sized hexagon, and a smaller hexagon. And they pinpointed the exact cells that do it. So you actually have like these cool, high-tech looking grids inside your brain that allow you to triangulate where you are on a big map, on a medium map, and where you are in your local space. In my case, I pretty much barely know where I am most of the time. So mine must not be working or mine are maybe like big kind of blobs instead of hexagons. But anyway, it's cool to know that we all have these. Today's guest is a guy uh, who I've wanted to chat with for a long time, very well known because he's the host of the National Geographic Channel's number one rated and Emmy nominated series called Brain Games. And his name is Jason Silva, in case you haven't heard of him. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's a privilege. Thanks. Uh, likewise, I mean, your your show's been out for three years now, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, been around for a while. It's uh, broadcast in 171 countries on the National Geographic Channel. And uh, it's just wild that ultimately what is an educational series has somehow found an audience that finds it so entertaining and enthralling. And we really have just a loyal fan base that we have continued to be able to do it for multiple seasons. So it's it's been really great. It, it seems like there's a bit of a renaissance for this stuff because we used to yeah. think, you know, you're born with so many gray cells and that's all you've got. And then, you know, you, they're fixed and, and then you die. Right. And now we have all this power and control and, and just knowledge about the brain's capacity for change. So I think you just hit the nail on the head with your timing. We launch the show and you're like, here's what cognitive scientists are doing. Here's what your brain can do, which is why like, I'm a big fan. I, I was really stoked <laughs> that we could connect. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I, I mean, I love doing the show because it's, uh, the, the, ultimately the message is what you see is not what you get. I mean, yeah. through, these, through, these, through exposing these loopholes in our cognition, these cognitive biases, the ways in which our, fr- our brain very much frames our reality, interprets our reality, fills in the blanks from the limited information we get through our senses, shows us that we really do create our world. And, you yeah. know, I remember last year when that, the dress thing went viral on the <laughs> internet, you know, people were what, like, what color was could, the dress? Yeah, what did like, you see? exactly. How could something so trivial become such a, cause such hysteria? And I think it's because at the end of the day, when your entire reality is called into question by something so trivial, it's a big deal. It's like an ontological panic, you could say. And people used to think that that was a, uh, a brain games kind of guerrilla marketing thing. And everybody kept like tweeting. My Twitter, went, my Twitter went crazy when that happened because people <laughs> made the immediate connection between the dress and the show, which to me says, you know, we've really gotten there. We've reached people especially young people. They love the show. Um, it's just, yeah, it's been a treat. And yeah, like you said, there's so much science coming out on the brain these days and uh, exponentially more in our capacity to understand the brain. I think it's just nice to have a show that's like bringing this stuff to the masses, you know? I saw somewhere somebody called you a Timothy Leary of the viral video age. I love <laughs> what do that. you think about that? <laughs> so that was a writer for The Atlantic named Ross Anderson, who is, uh, he's a wonderful guy. He wrote he wrote an essay on the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Telescope that was one of the mm-hmm. best pieces of writing I'd ever read in my life. And I remember when he contacted me to interview me, he sent me this particular article he'd written on the space telescopes mm-hmm. as a kind of as a way for me to vet him. And I was like, "Are you kidding me? Anybody <laughs> who can write about space and time the way he could can 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 interview me?" And it was when I was first doing uh, some of my digital content. It was right before Brain Games blew up. I do a lot of uh, videos on the web, like yeah. short two-minute videos, shots of awe. You've probably seen some of them. They're great. And thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, really? And uh, one of the key ideas of shots of awe is not just, you know, look at the, the, the immense speed at which technology is progressing, the sort of exponential Moore's law 
growth curves of information technology, biotech, nanotech. I mean, promising to kind of redefine what it means to be human through this insane symbiotic relationship we have with our tools. Mm. But, um, but also this idea that most people don't think about that um, there's a great book by John Markoff called What the Dormouse Said. Uh, yeah. John Markoff from the New York Times, which is about the counterculture and the cyberculture in the 1960s in Silicon Valley. Most people don't know that the origins of the tech revolution in Silicon Valley are, may, in many ways, psychedelic. You know, the whole yes. Burning Man ethos. <laughs> so a lot of these engineers, Hewlett, you know, Hewlett Packard, all these guys back in the 60s were, exper- you know, uh, were ex- Douglas Engelbart was the, the famous yeah. dude that was doing it. Were experimenting with psychedelics and then doing problem solving stuff for computers, and so. The idea was that in the end, and Timothy Leary was the key futurist that sort of articulated this, that computers could be reconceived as the new psychedelics. Psychedelics, the etymology means to make manifest mind. Mm -hmm. What is an iPhone if not manifest mind? What is a computer if not manifest mind? So this is the kind of stuff that I wanted to kind of put out there in my videos, this cyber, cyberdelic, as they call it, messaging. And so Ross Anderson picked up on that. And so that's when he... He was like, well, you're the Timothy Leary of the viral video age. And I was like, I'll take it. It's a great description. And so you, you, you take it. I was wondering if you'd be like, yeah, that's good. Or maybe that's not accurate. I uh, like too- Leary. I mean, I, I, I happen to think he's a freaking amazingly eloquent writer. And yeah, I mean, he he was a rabble rouser. And, and there's a lot of controversy there. But, but some he of was, the stuff that he, he was did, probably I think was really connected important. with the CIA. Like, I've seen some really deep research by oh, from another really? guest on here that's like, there's probably more to Timothy Leary than the common thing. But like there's definitely some interesting stuff there no matter whether you like him or hate him like it's it's noteworthy right yeah sure sure um to your point though i've actually had more out of body hallucinogenic experiences from really advanced neurofeedback than i have from any hallucinogen and i've done ayahuasca with shamans in peru and you know my my share of, of spiritual exploration with, yeah. with chemicals in a non party you know yeah, sure. uh, spiritual settings mm-hmm. as opposed to you know the yeah, of the, course. I went to a rave and, you know, magic yeah, yeah. stuff happened kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good to pre-configure your set and setting. It's, it, it's, yeah. it's a lesson we could learn from, from, I think, the psychonauts and the psychedelic explorers that we should actually apply in our normal waking states as well. Set and setting <laughs> matters when we're sober, too. Many of us live lives of quiet desperation because we've chosen to put ourselves in spaces and dwellings that have terrible feedback loops. So we're depressed well and we don't realize maybe it's because we don't like our job or maybe it's because we're in a miserable relationship or maybe it's we're not doing something meaningful, you know. We could have learned a lot from, uh, from those ideas, those heuristics of set and setting. It matters. I've been working a lot on that. I, I just finished building uh, Bulletproof Labs up here in my backyard. I'm on Vancouver Island. I, I live on a 32-acre organic farm. I wanted to have you know, views of the forest because those are actually good for your brain. Yeah. I wanted to have my own food that grows right over there that's good for your brain. Amazing. It, it, but I also wanted like a, an inspiring place to work. So I've got orange walls and all sorts of weird decorations. And that, awesome. that thing behind me yeah. is the world's first hard drive. Oh, and cool. In 1885, it won an innovation award as the best filing system, at least in North America and Canada and the US. Right. So like when you had to access data really, really fast, you got one of these things. Uh, it. <laughs> it's like my iPhone is like an yeah. infinite number of those. Sure. But like those are there to remind me uh, of those things and to just keep it playful because it is set and setting and if I'm going to create like the next book that's really good I, I don't think I could do it in like a, a mobile home uh, and that would have been the cheapest office for me but yeah. it just wasn't right so this is a convertible barn that is the studio and, and no, it's, it's brilliant I could see other artifacts behind you as well so it seems like you've created your own library of human imagination I, I'm I'm working really hard on it, and there's yeah. there's some stuff off camera too that's that's really really cool from the 50s. Yeah. And, and the idea here is almost all of it fits on the iPhone, but having it around is this reminder of like, look how far we've come, either in my life or in my parents' life. Yeah. And if you look at the shape of the curve, and, and you yeah. read like the Peter Diamandis stuff, and Peter and I oh, have yeah. become friends. Do you know oh, Peter? Sure. Yeah, of course. He's a friend of oh. mine, and Stephen Kotler as well. And I, yeah, both of them are friends of mine too. I speak and, to Kotler all the time. Kotler and Jamie Wheel. Those are my two like favorite people in the world. <laughs> okay, those guys are crazy. I'm actually an investor in the Flow Genome Project. Oh, excellent. Smart, yeah. I talk to so, Jamie all the time. Altered states to altered traits. Hacking yeah. flow, that whole thing. <laughs> it, yeah. It's true that, in fact, that's something we should chat about. Yeah. Uh, there, there's so many people who, who are like, well, I, I want to perform really well. I'm like, so you want to be abnormal, right? right. Like, no, well, no, no, I want to be normal. It's like, no. High performers are abnormal by definition. Like right. if you're an average performer, you're normal. 
Otherwise, right. like you're you're kind of going to be a tweaker on, on some yeah. level or or another. I don't mean tweaker like right. drug user. I just mean like people are going to look at you and go like that guy or th- that woman. They're odd. Like they're doing yeah. something different. Like they don't care about what I care about. Right. So the commitment to be non-average uh, is actually scary for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, I think it's always scary because you're kind of outside the consensus trance. You're kind of probing at the walls of what Robert Anton Wilson calls the reality tunnel. You're a, a little bit more like Steve Jobs with his reality distortion field. You're, you're, yeah. you're pulling people towards different visions. You're operating under you know, your, the beat of your own drummer. And sometimes that can be isolating. You, know, you get really effective at being yourself, at being high-functioning, but then it makes you sort of alienated from everyday people. Let's talk about intuition. Yeah. I, I've actively trained my intuition with unusual forms of neurofeedback and I need with, to do uh, that I've never done neurofeedback I need uh, to get into that all right let's uh, I will I will connect you with some resources there offline okay. I I put a, a bunch of CEOs celebrity types through this 40 years of Zen program that well it's correlated with an IQ boost that's pretty substantial and uh, it, wow. it's the biggest thing I've done I've spent 10 weeks of my life with electrodes glued to my head and there's a uh, Forty thousand dollar gel free neurofeedback setup that I, I use most evenings for an hour. Wow! Um, in fact, if I illegally download a copy of Brain Games, I can actually watch Brain Games as my feedback. Uh, unfortunately, wow. I can't do a streamed version. But right. what happens when I'm watching your show? Uh, I suppose maybe I could rip it or something. Anyway, I have to get a, an AAC format of your show. Yeah. And when I'm watching it, and my brain is in the state that I want. I see your show in color and full size. And uh-huh. when my brain is in the wrong state, I see it in black and white at half size. And the brain hates black and white half size stuff. So the brain goes like, what, how, what? And then it gets big again. And then as soon as I drift, it goes down. So literally, I'm learning something. I'm watching something. I, I uh-huh. oftentimes just watch like, you know, the latest science fiction, whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, but it, the cool thing is I actually got to watch TV. And my brain gets trained. But the downside is like after 45 minutes, you're cooked and like you're done. Yeah. Right, but sounds that would probably be very intense. It teaches you how to kind of focus in a deeper way, or something. It depends on what protocols you're training, but it's just, it's enhancing connectivity between different parts of the brain, which okay. can make it easier to stay in one state. You can train down ADD things, but there's also this default mode network, and I think you've covered that on your show, right? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, I mean the default mode network. I remember reading uh, Michael Pollan's article in the New Yorker about psychedelics, and he was saying yeah. that pretty much what they do is disrupt the default mode network, right? And that's yeah. like the ego, the, the sort of sense of self, the hard that's and probably, separation. No? That's probably more the wrong? active mode network, I'm guessing. Okay, okay. well, please, um, enlighten me. <laughs> no, no, I I'm, I'm, I'm didn't read the article, but I, I'm thinking about it. So we used to think either you're doing something, so your brain's in active mode, or you're doing nothing, so you're in default mode. Okay. And then in Oxford, they figured out, oh, you're always some in both, which is kind of how biology works, right? So it's, yeah. it's percentage of time. And sure. it turns out all the good stuff happens when you're in default mode. So when you're, you know, you're doing adult coloring, you're playing with, with clay, you're going for a walk in the woods, but you're right. not actively doing something, then all the creativity and intuition and all the good stuff that, that's been percolating in there, that's when it happens and that's when yeah. it comes out. Yeah. The problem is when you're in that default mode, you're usually in such a theta state that you, you don't remember it because it's like you don't right. remember your daydreams, you don't remember your dreams. So... Right the ability to dredge up what's happening in the unconscious and when you're in that default mode and to have enough active mode to keep a memory thread running, that's yeah. like a trick to getting more out. And for me, like all my best like product naming ideas and, and like what should I write about next? What's the whole topic of my next book? Like it comes when I allow the default mode to do something. So if you can train the strength of the default mode with yeah. electrodes, well, of course you should do that, right? Well, it's funny. I feel like I've somehow figured out a way to train that. And I think for me, it's always been the video camera. Um, oh, really? Because when, I, when I'm in that free associative state, um, with or without herbal enhancement, um, <laughs> what happens is you get a, a, your neocortex, you know, frontal lobe flooded with dopamine, pattern recognition increases, free association mm-hmm. increases. You're in flow, as, as Stephen Kotler says. Whatever it is, right. that walk in the park is triggering that flow. Um, but I've always had at the same time really high executive function. In fact, like there is a incessant journalist reporter in me that needs to document <laughs> the moment. And so when I'm flooded 
by those patterns, when I'm flooded by those ideas, those daydreaming whimsies, I like manically remember to transcribe verbally. So you, you trained yourself to be more creative and to have yeah. more intuition just by that act, right? Yeah, yeah. There's always been this obsession with transience and the fact that, in more, that, that the inspirational moments are so fleeting. And I think the video camera there was a way of like, like stretching and, and like immortalizing the moment. And it just became like second nature to me. Um, if you watch my shots of awe, they're not scripted. There is no script. There's like barely even an outline. I mean, sometimes I'll have like right. a quote or like like a name of like an idea that I think would be cool to explain. But the majority of times we're out in Big Sur Sea Ranch, you know, me and like two guys, one camera guy and my friend, and we just go for a walk. We go for a walk, we get in the zone, we're in the flow, we just yeah. And then it's like it's all subconscious. And when I tap in, you yeah. know, the, the episodes just vomit out. But I the reason they're like that is because I want it to feel like you're, you're, I'm going for a walk with you and I got inspired and I'm explaining to you an idea. The, the yoga people call that, you know, connecting to source. And, and yeah. like, you, you can yeah. pick like whatever like hippie name you want for it, but there's a, a specific neurochemical, biological, and probably magnetic thing, who knows. Yeah. But yeah, when you go there, I, I don't script most of my stuff either. There you go. There you go. Uh, and and it, it, it's like, I, I go well, on stage. it's just like life. The best conversations yeah. are not scripted. It's just about right. whether you can summon that when there's a camera or, or an audience. <laughs> In fact, one of the things that, that teenagers are often, uh, they often do as their brains are growing their prefrontal cortex, they're sitting in a conversation with you or with another teenager, and instead of listening, they're thinking about what they're going to say next. And like their whole brain is consumed by what they're going to say next. That's pre-scripting, and it actually takes away a good conversation. It makes some crappy listeners, no offense teenagers listening, you're actually listening to this and doing a good job, but on average, your listening skills aren't trained as well as they are going to be when you're 30. And like, you know, you can probably be the outlier abnormal person who's a great listener when you're 15. It's just mm -hmm. harder, right? Mm -hmm. But... When you, you go through that whole process and you realize at some point, like, okay, I'm going to actually listen fully and I'm not going to plan. And then I'm going to trust and be comfortable with what comes out of my mouth. Just like this interview, like we didn't script this. Like I have some right. notes about like, you know, your background. So I remember to say yeah. all the good stuff you've done, but like, I'm not reading questions. I'm, I'm, right. you know, bringing You're them responding. down. Yeah. What happens to me if, um, I try to be a good listener, but a lot of the times if you're telling me something, if somebody's saying something and like maybe you're a third of the way into what you're saying, but that by the time you're only a third of the way in, I'm already getting some crazy response. <laughs> then there's a desire to interrupt you to sort of chime in as an aside. It takes discipline to hold it in and just trust that I'll still remember by the time you're done. There are some communicators who have to communicate every little detail in linear order before they'll stop. Yeah. And I, that can be frustrating because... What's running in my head when I'm recording an episode or when I'm talking with someone is like, is what I'm saying useful for the other person? Is it useful for the audience? Otherwise, I'm okay to just shut up and be quiet. Mm -hmm. And I think some people, it's like, I have to get the whole story out. If I don't get the whole thing out, like I've somehow not succeeded. And I think there's different cognitive styles. I'm not saying mine's better. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what it is. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, have you have you done any any research into things like Myers Briggs or, or like the Colby score? I have not. Does that have to do with like uh, pumping up your intelligence or something or measuring? Well, Myers Briggs is sort of that. You know, what are your what are your personality traits most most likely to be? So it's it's a personality inventory. But the okay. Colby score is something that uh, Dan Sullivan, one of the the big entrepreneurial coach guys who's been coaching for like forty years some very, very successful entrepreneurs, and uh, he coaches me. He uses this thing called the Colby score, which is just four numbers, and you answer a bunch of questions, and it gives you a score. And the first number is, is called your fact finder index. And, and I find it fascinating because some people, like if you're a nine or a 10 on the scale, like you're going to get every bit of information before you make a decision. And if you're one, you're like, sounds good, and you just go with it, right? And, and I'm like a four, so I'm kind of in the middle. So like I, I'm going to get enough information and it doesn't mean I can't get all the info. It doesn't mean I can't move quickly. It just means my instinct is to get enough info to be reasonably certain and then to take action. Yeah. Right? And then course correct over time. But there are other personality types where their instinct is, oh, no, I will take no action until it's perfect. And, yeah. and it's, it's really intriguing when you figure out those traits. And you're like, oh, wait, that's what I do when I'm not thinking about it. But when I think about it, I may do something entirely different. Yeah. And, and that self-awareness for me from that score was, was pretty cool. 
Well, we've done like little games on brain games that show that we're in such a rush to make a conclusion from the stimuli that assaults us that we often miss little details. Right. Most of the time, it doesn't really matter or cost us anything. But for the purposes of entertainment, we'll have somebody read, you know, uh, so, what is it like? Uh, New York in the the spring, for example. We'll say the word. We'll write the word the twice. And we'll right. have a bunch of volunteers read the sentence out loud. And they'll read it 15 times before they catch the extra the. And the reason is because their brain is doing a quick Snapchat, a snapshot and already just sort of extrapolating the meaning from just seeing a couple of the words in the sentence. And, of course, missing the error because they don't expect to see an error. So they just simply don't see the error. And so that would be an example of us just very quickly making a decision about the stimuli that's coming in, deciding what something means without, like, be paying attention to the details. It, it makes so much sense, and yeah. especially if you're going to apply that back to yourself. Right. I, I think it, it's even harder because there's some sort of self-defense mechanism against, against paying attention to yourself. I, I think you'd call that the ego. How much of your personal learnings have been about like the ego and, and the ego's role in, in how you behave? Um, yeah, very much so. I mean, I, uh, I think the book that affected me the most is a book by Ernest Becker called The Denial of Death, which distills the human condition um, to the fact that we are uniquely aware in the animal kingdom of our mortality. So it's not about like imminent demise. It's just about the fact that one day... And the kind of anxiety that that and distress that that causes the ego, you know, man cannot live without a continuous belief of something indestructible within himself. And so the ego is constantly tense. And the reason in many ways that we subordinate our environment or that we seek fame or power is as a defense or sort of as a raging protest against this impending doom. And it makes a lot of sense. I also think it's, why psychedelic psychotherapy, at least for people <laughs> with terminal cancer, seems yeah. to be so effective in making them let go of that terrifying fear. Um, at the same time, though, the ego is necessary for our oh, yeah. ingenuity and creativity and goal-seeking behavior. So I think it's mostly about the knobs and levers approach, as Jamie Wheel and Kotler talk mm -hmm. about to editing subjectivity, to editing our phenomenological experience. So maybe it's not fully obliterating the ego, but maybe it's just knowing when to set it aside, when to dissolve it temporarily. Um, but then once you reconstitute, maybe you'll have a different set of priorities, you know? So I, I'm interested in that whole space, the, the subjective space and how to play with it. it it's pretty powerful when you, you, you get a model that works for you I, I kind of look at the ego as the meat operating system, and, and its job is to make sure the species doesn't die. So mm -hmm. it, It's going to tell you to eat everything so mm -hmm. you don't starve. It's going to tell you to screw everything to make sure there's enough babies. <laughs> and, and it's going to tell you to run away or kill things that are scary. Right? Like Pretty much that's the operating system you need for any species to survive. It's only three sure. things. And yeah. like pretty much every ego-driven behavior is one of those things, including avoid death is avoid scary things. So sure. it, it'll create these amazing, fantastic fantasies just to create to avoid death or the thought of death because it's too scary, even yeah. though that might not be in your best interest, it's still going to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, that that's at least what's led me to to be able to make more decisions that are free of fear instead of with free of fear. Have you have you been able to to get there? I I mean I think that if I I would say that my greatest creativity comes from letting go for sure. Yeah. Um, however, I think a lot of my effectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and and just cut, uh, my my ability to get things done that the, the hustle and the anxiety and the fire in the belly um, is has been equally important to take that creativity and turn it into something uh, prolific and impactful in the world. And you know, I grew up in Venezuela. I'm Jewish. I'm neurotic. Uh, Venezuela is very dangerous. I was always afraid. Oh God, are they were being followed. Are we going to get kidnapped? Like is somebody breaking into our home? Yeah. Like. It's a messed up place to grow up. Even in the nicest neighborhood, you're still kind of a target. That vigilance um, has probably turned into a tool that makes sure that when I'm inspired, I have the camera around. <laughs> you know, there, there's yeah. this kind of dance between the sort of creative musings and the sort of effective, piercing will. 
to do something with that. Well, the, if you take the anxiety and you generalize it to passion, the anxiety is a form of passion and so is, yeah. is desire, right? So, yeah. so if, if you're going to shoot the most amazing two minute YouTube thing ever, yeah. you can come to it like with, with a, I have a certain degree of anxiety fueling me and you can make something amazing. And you can flip it over and say, I have like passion to, to create something amazing or something that's going to help a lot of people. And, and for me, my whole career, especially in the early days, it, it was driven by curiosity. Like, but it was like out of this, oh my God, like I'm going to starve. I'm not good enough. And, and all the, like the, the negative anxiety yeah. things. And, and I had full on sure. PTSD from like very early childhood. You did? Uh, like, from birth, I was born with a cord wrapped around my neck choking me. And that gives you PTSD. Like, like everything's a threat when you come into the world that's full of threats, yeah. right? My dad was born with a cord around his neck. Uh, um, I've also read recently that Holocaust survivors will pass down the trauma in their genes. And so, my first book was had that in it. Yes, oh, it's okay. totally true. Yes. Yeah, which is insane. And then, of course, my parents divorced young. I was a sort of that that was traumatic. And then a dangerous country like Venezuela, all yeah. those PTSD issues. And then you have already a philosophical mind and inquiring mind reading yeah. books about the denial of death. You know, it's like when I bump my head against the cabinet, I want to go get a CAT scan to make sure I don't have micro bleeding, you know, <laughs> like I am, I am, I can veer off in that direction, you know, then people see shots of awe and brain games and they're like, oh, he, he seems so relaxed and passionate. I'm like, well, you know, it's a dance, you know, it's because you're it. in that state. When you're in that state, yeah. you're not in that other anxiety state, right? Right. right. Well, exactly. well, there's for me, what did it was uh, heart rate variability training, which consciously trains you to turn off that fight or flight. And then when you have a, a lie detector, basically, on your head looking at your brainwaves, and you're like, I'm not afraid, and it's like, like all right, yeah. fine. All right, I guess I am afraid of that. And then it's like, all right, I, I've let go of whatever that trauma was, and it's like, like damn it. Right? Yeah. So basically every time I've done the training, like you either cry or throw up because you, yeah. you come to some horrible self-truth. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, wow. oh, man, like, you know, I, I guess I, I still have some work to do there. And then there's ways to go in and, and repattern things. So for me, that's, that's let me not give up any of those states, but actually access more states mm -hmm. uh, and to do it without the stress and anxiety. So part of the whole philosophy behind Bulletproof, uh, the brand, is that it's not supposed to be a struggle. Like right. the Buddhist, life is a struggle. Like, well, yeah, it, it is, but it doesn't have to be a hard struggle and it can mm -hmm. require effort without you struggling. Right? Yeah, and and the that. difference between working your ass off and struggling to work your ass off is that one of them hurt and the other one can be joyful. Right. Right? <laughs> and so I'm, I agree. I'm opposed I mean, to struggle. If, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. It's yeah. what everyone says, you know? Mm -hmm. I feel like for me, the struggle is when I come up against perceived biological limits you know when i'm jet lagged <laughs> when i didn't get enough sleep when you know that's like yeah. when i'm just like oh shit you know what i mean um, right but in general if, if i'm able to take care of those variables then i usually feel pretty good yeah the the biological limits pissed me off the most because i weighed 300 pounds because i had arthritis when i was 14 in my knees you weighed uh, 300 pounds i did yeah wow. and, and i had like severe brain fog in my mid-20s uh, and just all sorts of autoimmune things. I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, and I had toxic mold syndrome. Like I was living in a, a moldy house that just jacked my brain up. So emotional irregularity, uh, wow. inability to remember stuff, and just like my biology was really bad. So I, I became like hyper focused from that anxiety space we talked about. Right. On like, okay, I'm old when I'm 20. Like I have stretch marks still that I, I don't know how to get rid of. And it's like, okay. All that stuff, I, I'm going to just own it. So I, I learned all that from old people, <laughs> like anti-aging experts who are like twice or three times my age because their techniques for turning on biology were working for me. And then I was wow. like, wait a minute, what if and now that I'm back to health, what if I keep going? And you, you keep hacking the human body more and more. And, and at that point, you're like, all right, I hang out with a lot of transhumans. And I mean, you consider yourself a transhumanist, don't you? Yes, I think transhumanism. I mean, look... I, I have no doubt that there are scenarios that people can envision that sound really scary and the whole, like, of, of course, the eugenics with the oh, Nazis, yeah. horrible stuff. But, but like, from the perspective that I'm coming from, and I think that people like Ray Kurzweil or Peter Diamandis or Stephen Kotler, even Jamie Wheel are, you know, we, Martin McLuhan said it, we build the tools and the tools build us. We use our tools to extend our limits. We use our tools to extend our reach. We've had yep. a symbiotic relationship with technology forever. We've used technology to overcome problems, including doubling the human lifespan. And 
even though new technologies sometimes cause new problems, they solve more problems than they create, and we can always evolve newer technologies to solve those unintended consequences. So I, I'm, a, I'm a fiercely optimistic, and I'm philosophically pro the idea that, that we, you know, the, humanity is an engineering project. It's an engineering project <laughs> that we need to put all of our labor and creative efforts into, and we are the canvas. We are the work of art, and you know, rage against the dying of the light, as Dylan Thomas said. So I'm 100% pro, like, immortalism, radical life extension, biotech interventions to augment ourselves all the way, yeah. You and I are, are, are cut from the same cloth there. And yeah. what I've learned, uh, so back in the, the very early days of cyberpunk, I was reading this stuff, and like, I, I can't wait to get robot arms. But, yeah. but actually, I, maybe I'm older and wiser, it doesn't make sense to upgrade your hardware until you've made full use of it. Mm. And so I, I would love to see even more research go into how do I make my mitochondria work better? How do I have full control over my hormonal systems? Because we have all these knobs and levers inside our bodies, these biological control systems, delicate feedback loops, and most of them we're unaware of. The ones yeah. we know about, we usually smash them on the head with, with chemicals that don't actually fit right into the locks, but right. they're very profitable, so we do that. Yeah. And we ignore yeah. the effect of lights and timing of food and type of exercise and all these things that are huge variables. Oh, but yeah. since everyone does them all the time, we think they're non-variables. And so well, I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think bio biology is a technology, and the knobs and levers mm -hmm. approach to biology, to optimizing our self-systems, as, as, as Jamie mm -hmm. Wheel says in his great TEDx talk, you know, we turn our, our leaky bucket, our colander, into a chalice. You know, like, why not optimize all the way? Like, yeah, yeah. The, the external interventions can come when they, when, they, when they come. But I agree. In the meantime, like, op radical optimization from within is, is, is hugely important. Ironically, it's not immediately accessible. I mean, other than shopping at Whole Foods, like, I wouldn't really know where to start. Do you know what I mean? I try to yeah. eat healthy. I eat brown rice. I eat lean protein. But, like, still, I mean, I see what you're doing, and I'm like, well, maybe if I had a, a sort of virtual you with me all the time telling me <laughs> when to sleep and how to act, it'd be easier. But that, you know, I travel a lot. I'm on the road. I mean, it's hard. So oh, yeah. Sometimes me, I'm just like, too. I wish I had the nanobots, you know? Well, I'm, I'm competing with Ray Kurzweil for the number of vitamins a day, and I have been for a decade, more than a decade. Oh, and and my, my stated number, 180. I think I can make it to 180, and that's only because I had a really crappy start to my biology. <laughs> like, wow. Uh, wow. I probably would be capable of more, and, and I'm not have joking. You, have you cured yourself of all those illnesses you mentioned The, the vast majority of them. There's still, still some autoimmune stuff that's genetic uh, that I don't like, and I'm, I'm actively working on it. And mm -hmm. so... I, I am incredibly strong and resilient. I sleep six hours a night. It's all I need. Like, like I've slept six hours a night for more than a thousand nights. Not because yeah. it was the only amount I could sleep. It's because like I've optimized my sleep. To, and my biology yeah. works so well that that's all the cleaning my brain needs at night. And I wake sure. up and I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. And, and so stuff like that, yeah, I, I feel like, like I've never been stronger. Like my, my blood markers are good. And when they're yeah. not good, I know how to control them and put them back. Right. Mm -hmm. but I, I still react to a few foods I don't want to react to, but way less than ever before. So the trajectory of the, the arrow is good, but uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you in another 20 years, and my goal yeah. is to look younger than I do today in 20 years. And I'm not saying that because I want to sound like a, a psycho. I actually no. believe that, and I yeah. have a half a million dollar laboratory downstairs where right. I do stuff that no one on earth does right. in order to Amazing. make myself live longer. Like I'm dead serious about this. Amazing. And it's not because I'm afraid of dying. Like I'm totally happy to die. I just want to die of circumstances I choose when I choose. That's it. Like, but like, death, fine, whatever. Well, right. but then you go. Indefinite lifespan. Yeah. Like, yes. like it's up to you, not imposed by entropy. Yes. I think that, uh, I don't know if you've ever read a book by Alan Harrington, 1968, called The Immortalist. Yes, I have read that. That's a magnificent book. I mean, I'll never forget. One of the best lines is, we must never forget we are cosmic revolutionaries, not stooges conscripted to advance a natural order that kills everyone. And I always <laughs> thought that that's just like beautifully said because he, yes. he sort of just rages against the ridiculousness of ennobling mortality. He says, any philosophy that accepts death must itself be considered dead. Its questions meaningless, its consolations worn out. And for me, this comes less from a place of vanity and more from a place of deep attachment to the things and people I love. You know, yeah. my love of music, of instruments, of art, of family, of friendship, of lovemaking, of all these things that make life sunny and lusty and beautiful. You know, my love of aesthetic arrest, my love of learning. I just, 
I just feel like how could you go from that to to being food for worms? It doesn't make sense. It it only makes sense if you believe in something that I, I pretty much never talk about on Bulletproof Radio. At least I, maybe I have with a couple of shamans uh, uh, about like reincarnation. And I, I know that you have an episode coming up that I, I really want to see the the God Brain, where you go to Israel yeah. and you talk about the God Brain because there's research that says believing in God may be hardwired in our brains. Sure. There's another set of research though that says reincarnation might be a Darwinian evolved survival thing for our species. Well, there's actually a really strong case. It's, uh, this is a hard scientific book. The, the guy's name is Todd, and he's actually a friend, and I'm blanking on his last name because he's one of those friends where you know his first name. <laughs> and it's kicking my butt right now. I'll put his name in the show notes. Ah, I could probably find him on my phone. Anyway, um, there's a full book with scientific credentials talking about, okay, here's all the, the, the things that don't make sense if you believe that there's, that there's no reincarnation. And here's the scientific case for why the species would be stronger if there was. And here's where those things line up. So it's a good hypothesis. We haven't proven it yet, but it's not unreasonable. Interesting. And, and then death becomes something different if you believe well, that. Sure. Which, if you believe in anything, then it becomes something different. Well, let me ask you, during mm-hmm. your ayahuasca trip, did you see the self-transforming machine elves that McKenna talks about? I mean, did you come out of that experience feeling like, well, I'm an infinite being after all? Or I've or done the, I, I, I've not seen the machine elves, although, um, yeah, I've actually never seen machine elves. I've certainly read the descriptions. And during some neurofeedback and during some uh, holotropic breathing with Stan Groff, um, for people listening, Stan Groff Yeah, he wrote LSD, LSD psychotherapy. <laughs> Yeah, with 10,000 patients for years legally with LSD. When it became banned, he invented a kind of breathing that makes you trip. I've I've breathed with him personally. He was you know, 84 years old at the time, I think. And I mean, you you see things. I saw more there than I did on ayahuasca, to be honest. Wow. Wow. Uh, very profound stuff that, that does make you realize that your place in the universe is probably bigger and smaller than you thought it was. Yeah. Uh, you remember and, the movie Contact? Yeah. Jodie Foster. That was based on a Carl Sagan novel. Right. I thought the film was magnificent and beautiful, and I relate to her. I mean, she's the wonder junkie, and she's totally secular. However, the end of the film presents a wonderful philosophical dilemma for the ever-secular uh, astronomer that she was. So the end of the film, you know, they, they build the thing. It spins around, supposedly mm-hmm. creating a warp drive, and then they drop her capsule through it. Then, as soon as the drop happens, we're within her POV. Within right. her POV, she slings shots across the galaxy for I don't know how many hours. She's wearing a little ma- uh, mounted camera on her forehead. She freaking goes to the other edge of the galaxy. She says, I had no idea they should have sent a poet. She meets the aliens in the form of her <laughs> father's ghost so that they could communicate with her in that virtual reality. Has the ontological awakening, sees the light, so to speak, then comes back falls through the warp, warp drive and is right back on Earth. So then what happened? She says, oh my God, I went across the universe, I saw it. And they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at the camera first, the external camera. The external camera shows that her capsule goes right through instantly. It was not out of sight for more than a millisecond. That's the external camera. So then she's faced with a crisis of faith. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between her experience and somebody who thinks they see God? Or somebody who took ayahuasca and saw the self-transforming machine elves. So then we're like, wow, okay, so finally she's having a taste of her own medicine because now she's forced into the corner of those religious nuts that she was criticizing before. (laughs) So, right? Because that's the external camera. But then they said, well, what about the camera that she was wearing on her forehead? And they're like, oh, that just recorded static, so that doesn't count. But then the last line in the movie says, what troubles me is not that that camera recorded static, but that it recorded 13 hours of it. Yes. And then you're like, <laughs> oh, so she did go. So I guess my question to those people who have near-death experiences, religious experiences, you know, people who take ayahuasca and see God and say that space and time collapse, if there was a way of measuring subjective time, if we had yeah. the equivalent of that head-mounted camera for the tripper who says that the LSD opens a portal to another dimension— And we could say, okay, well, we filmed them from the outside, and they were only tripping for six hours. But the camera inside their subjective world recorded a thousand days. Then then it's like the movie Inception. Then it's like dream within a dream. Five minutes in the real world, uh, ten hours in dream. But, like, there is no way to measure phenomenology. So it's easier. There is? 
Well, just the way you're talking Quantum. about, like, so would, when I do some of the advanced neurofeedback stuff, like you trip, like, like I, I've dissolved into the universe, I, I've seen past life, like, like crazy stuff that should not happen. There is no drugs involved. All you're doing is you're basically like every time your brain does something you don't want to do, you tell it shut up, and eventually it gets out of its own way, and you're like, okay, hold on, like, like you know, stuff's happening. I don't have arms right now. Okay, no drugs involved, just just advanced meditation kind of stuff. But meditation with rubber bumpers, when you do it wrong, it gets quiet, so it's easier. It's cheating. <laughs> but when when I've done that sort of thing, I, I I do it. At the end of it, they say, how much time was it? And what you find is that when people have profound experiences, they will report. Oh, geez, it felt like that was like a four or six hour thing. Right. And when people are kind of slogging through it, like, oh, God, it felt like it was maybe a half hour, but it was just boring. Right, so we can say, look, there's a correlation between I had an amazing thing and I felt like I had this huge time. So there's there's hints of this happening at least. And if you do that ten thousand times with a whole bunch of people, you're like, wait, why is it that time dilates when people are having a spiritual experience versus they don't? It doesn't mean they are having one. It just means that when they report one, they think time is longer. But right, there's but something I guess to my that. question, I'm always obsessed with well, what really happened. Like if Jodie yeah. Foster didn't have the head mounted camera. And we only had the external camera, mm-hmm. which shows that she went right through, and then her subjective account of going across the galaxy. Because there are some people who say aliens already have visited us. They're called psychedelics. Psychedelics <laughs> are the warp drives yeah. that open the portal to another dimension. That a more advanced alien civilization doesn't need rockets or starships. They have these magical chemicals that open interdimensional portals, and that's the whole essence sure. of other dimensions. And so, and so my point is. It's like Jodie Foster saying she went, but without the camera that recorded 13 hours. And my whole problem is, well, did it really happen? I'm like, well, did she really go? Well, subjectively she did. Objectively, I don't know. Does it matter? Because at the end of the day, only subjectivity matters. But then what are you going to do when somebody's paranoid schizophrenic who's being distressed and we're like, well, those visions aren't real. Do you know what I mean? Like if, if if we tell you that subjectivity is real, then all of a sudden anything becomes possible and i don't know if that's good either well maybe brain waves really matter so what if we find that every time someone has this combination of brain waves they have this in the front of the brain this in the back these are in in phase these are out of phase whatever it is so, so when they self-report a mystical experience and the mystical experience has these characteristics say machine elves and the brain waves do this is having the fact that the brain actually did what makes multiple people see the same thing, is that a valuable piece of info? And I think it's one of the most precious pieces of information that we have for human beings to say, okay, uh, um, these altered states, by the way, high performance is an altered state, right? <laughs> these altered states are quantifiable and they're reproducible because you could take someone who has this mystical experience with this set of brain waves and you can train this brain, which might be very difficult and it might be debilitating, <laughs> but you can train this brain to have the same brain waves and they'll likely have the same experience. And sure. at that point, you've taken some of the subjectivity out. We can show brainwave equivalence or proximate brainwave equivalence, and we can say both people subjectively report, I met a fairy or an angel or what, whatever we're trying to reproduce, right? But if, if the same brain state produces the same subjective reality, I think that's a very big scientific step than saying uh, people just see random shit, right? Fair enough. Well, so I don't want to steal your thunder on uh, your February 21st episode, but so what did you learn in Israel with the God Brain? Because I'm interested. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, you know, we went to a place that would provide a good wallpaper for that notion, the neuroscience of religious experience. Um, It's not like we went to trash religion or anything like that, but we wanted to show the way, the ways religious, the ways in which religious belief affects our neurobiology. I remember we went to see this guy in a crazy cathedral, and we were talking about how architecture, how cathedrals are designed. Architecture has a intentionality behind it. Architecture can script our inner world. Um, that's a powerful thing, you know, not just when people are tripping, but sometimes when people are praying to God, you know, people experience Stendhal syndrome when they see some of this religious architecture and they see the, the Sistine Chapel paintings, people will collapse. Um, music, organs mm-hmm. that they play in these churches. These things also like arrest the body, mind, control attention, point it towards these ecstatic places. These are altered states of consciousness. And uh, and so we looked at the way religion does that. We also did these funny games where we would offer people like a hundred bucks to say they don't believe in God. 
So, <laughs> you know, we'd give them a hundred dollars and be like, you know, for a hundred dollars, would you say that you, you know, are, are a nasty person for a hundred dollars? Would you say that you are dishonest for a hundred dollars? Would you do that? We just ask them to, and people are happy to say whatever you want for the money. But then when you're like, well, for a hundred dollars, would you say you don't believe in God? Then they got weird. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Even like non-religious people, they just didn't feel like cursing belief in God for money. They just, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, karma or something. I don't know. It's probably a bad bet. If you, if you ascribe even a small right. percentage exactly. of likelihood to any of that being possible, then you're like, exactly. like you know, like bad this bet. is kind of playing with fire, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. So would you do it? Um, would I do it? It's an interesting question. I'm agnostic, right? Yeah, I'm like so one of those I. people that I'm slightly, I'm slightly jealous of those that have so much faith that they have no fear kind of thing. <laughs> um, but I'm also not ready to resign all possibility to be surprised because I've been surprised before. Um, but yeah. We also went and visited a lab where they're doing uh, sort of brain-machine interfaces. Oh, that's so that cool. Make, that make us more like gods. And so what happens when we can sort of think objects to move and all of a sudden we're having godlike power. So that was also a part of the show. Um, it's going to be a cool one. I, I a, cannot a, wait uh, to see that yeah, one because yeah. one of the things that 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 I believe is that when you uh, when you feel hate and and just negative emotions mm-hmm. towards another person, that, that it, it takes something from you. And and I, I see that on with neurofeedback. Like it actually does cost me something uh, to spend time on hate. Like it, it's carrying someone else's baggage for them. I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, sure. But I also think that it it actually harms them on some weird, hard to define level. Uh, like so, if you make yourself more like God because you have a brain machine interface. <laughs> You better have damn good control of your emotions because if you're like, I control the death laser, and like, oh, damn, I just, I, I thought a hateful thought about that guy over there. Now he's smoking rubble. That's, that's <laughs> like, a very good point. That's a very good point. It's like the movie Minority Report where they, they could sort of predict somebody's uh, likelihood of making a crime. Well, I mean, I don't know if we want people monitoring our every thoughts. That's, uh, that's, that, would be, that would be not good, I think. One of the great dangers of neuroscience right now is something that is happening even in the field of neurofeedback where you take a, a thousand people and you get their brain waves. You go, look, this is what a healthy brain looks like. I just averaged this out, All right? So you take that brain state and you say, you know, I'm gonna take a, someone, someone who's in jail and I'm gonna train them to that brain state and it changes their life. The non-recidivism goes down, like they, they stop the violent impulses and, and like, like life is better. Like, like you fundamentally help someone. So like, great, I, I've unlocked the code. I'm just going to do that for everyone. But, but what you're actually doing is you're taking F students and making them C students. Great. You're also taking the A students and making them C students. So you can actually uh, you know, take away your unique advantages, your unique benefits. And what we could end up with, if we go down the minority report side of things, is where we actually have, like, like you ever hear that song where they take like the average song that everyone would like? Like the, the average, oh, all, yeah. all the, and it's like the most banal, just horrible music you'd ever want to sure. hear. It's like a little bit of sax, yeah. a little bit of that, right. but it, it's junk. Yeah, yeah. Well, it would kill, it would kill the richness of our diversity that it, makes us yeah. so special, right? And there's a whole thing now about like neurodiversity and how important yeah. that is to have different kinds of brains. Yeah. Like having an artist and a hardcore scientist in the same room is is important. In the same society is critically important because they're just yes. different. And, and neither is better than the other. I, I come from the science side of things, but I tell you, I, I respect the hell out of the guy who wrote, you know, Rage Against the Dying of the Light, one of my, my favorite uh, right. lines from a poem, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't write that, and I don't know that right. my brain would have, but it sure is good. Right. right. I couldn't agree more. Well, what do you do for your brain? So you, you've had a chance to talk to all these neuroscientists. Uh, what do you do to, to keep your brain happy and healthy? Like, like, what are your big things? My big things are sleep, you know, I'm not really into staying up till four in the morning. Yeah, I uh, I really need my sleep to be able to regulate emotions. You know, I just I, vital for me. Um, in my morning routine, I, I do like coffee in the morning. I, I need to start having your bulletproof coffee, but I'm it's usually honestly. like a like a double or triple iced espresso in the morning. Um, and then like you know like a well, workout, I'll wake up, I'll do some push ups, I'll do some pull ups, just like spend like thirty minutes or something just doing something. Um, if I can, if I'm in like in West coast or something, I love hiking. So I'll go for a hike. I'll do whatever or something like that. Um, but my mornings are usually like left brain productivity, task oriented. 
And then my afternoons in an ideal day are decompress, uh, free associational, creative. So that's kind of how I do it. It's like the morning is coffee, the afternoon is divergent thinking. And that, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a cool setup. Yeah. Uh, in terms of food, is, have you seen any, any research, stuff that makes the brain work better, not work as well? Obviously, coffee makes your brain work better, at least in the short term, in studies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other than that, I, uh, do you have stuff? I, I, I've been doing the, I mean, I grew up eating beans and legumes in Venezuela. So I'm a big, I'm a sucker for like the protein rich vegetables like lentils. So I'm like a brown rice and lentil guy. You know, if there's quinoa, even better with cool. like lean chicken breast or salmon. There's a bunch of places in New York that are like, you know, fast food places of ultra healthy kind of brown ricey type of places. Oh, yeah. Um, that's, I could eat that every single day. Like I could have brown rice and lentils for, for lunch and dinner every day. I really could. Um, that kind of food has always served me well. I've been the same weight for a long time. I, uh, my energy level has always been good. Um, digestive system has always been good with that kind of a diet. Uh, you're, you're fortunate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have a lot of bread, but sometimes if I'm in a hotel and I'm having, you know, eggs for breakfast because they don't have brown rice and lentils, I'll have some <laughs> wheat toast. But like all this stuff now is saying that bread is actually not good. So. It, it seems like there's some pretty good evidence for it, but bread is, is a bigger problem for some people than others. But it, in yeah. my research anyway, it's never something that is, is going to make you as strong as a better choice. Like brown rice versus bread, I'd say always eat the brown rice. Of course, I'd yeah. also say eat the white rice instead of the brown too. So you would? <laughs> it's a spectrum. I would, yeah. How, how come? 80 times more arsenic in the brown rice than the white rice. And so I've heard of this, but yeah. even like the organic farm brown mm-hmm. rice has that stuff? Yep. And, and also, the amount of quote vitamins you get in there, it's trivial. And there's also some anti nutrients, oh, really? like, like the seed protects itself from predation by covering itself in things that keep you from absorbing the vitamins. So I look at rice as a source of energy. Right, but the nutrients come from plants, not seeds, like, not especially like rice kind of grains. So I'm huh. like, yeah, put some rice on there. Eat your your broccoli, eat your kale, preferably cooked, and and all of your other things, egg yolks, stuff like that. But but to count on the brown rice to give you a little bit of B vitamin, come on, there's not a B vitamin there in there to matter, but there's enough arsenic to matter. So it's one of those Got like. Got it. So you would actually say like, don't have the brown rice at all. Just have white rice. It, what say, about had, the beans and lentils? If you have a choice, go for the white rice. But if you don't have a choice, go for the brown rice. Unless it sure. like causes massive digestive distress, then you no, shouldn't because no. it's not good for you, right? right and right. lentils for me are on the suspect foods list. There's a group of people who kick ass on lentils and, and they're perfectly fine. They're relatively high in starch. Like you eat a higher starch diet than I do, which is also okay. okay. Uh, but there's also a big group of people who think lentils are supposed to be healthy. And whenever they eat them and they eat them every day, it makes them weak. Like it, it messes with their digestion. They're not genetically set up to digest them. And, and it wow. causes an immune problem in those people. So I'm like, if, if it works for you and it does, then cool, it's, it's all right. Like we're, we're all different people. But having that roadmap that says like, it's okay to not like lentils and it's okay to eat lentils, but you better measure your results and just and honor the results because those are your subjective reality yeah. <laughs> versus what you know, evidence-based medicine says, sure. which is actually pharmaceutical evidence-based medicine for the most part and it didn't even pay attention to food very well. So what is your, what is like an ideal meal for you then? Uh, for me, uh, so uh, the Bulletproof Diet was like my New York Times sort of manifesto about like, here's what you can do. And there's a set of foods that are, uh, that are I call them bulletproof. And these are foods that are full of nutrients, but more importantly, full of energy without a lot of downside. And then there's a group of foods, the suspect foods, they have downsides for big numbers of people, but none for others. So you just need to eliminate suspects. Either they're, they're innocent or guilty, just sort them out and then you're good. And then there's kryptonite foods like MSG and margarine and food additives. And I put gluten on there too. That's like, you don't need to eat that stuff ever to be high performing. So for me, I eat a plate covered in vegetables, like literally a full plate of vegetables. And then I cover that in guacamole or grass fed butter, like a lot of fat, 70% of my calories. And then the rest is grass fed beef or wild caught fish, like a moderate amount of it. And the fats are specific healthy fats, no corn oil, none of that. But it's pretty much, that's it. It's a plant-based diet. It's a big plate of, of plants with a little bit of very healthy animal protein, no industrial meat whatsoever. And when I eat that way, I, 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 don't, I need less sleep. Like I maintain my body weight, I, I have energy all day, like more now than I did when I was 20. But that's like, wow. that's my recipe and the principles behind it are like, there's an algorithm to figure out your best thing. But if you went on my diet, you might experience better emotional regularity. You might also just be like, I feel like crap all the time and I can't sleep, right? 
But if you follow the rules of get rid of the things that make you weak and do more of what makes you strong, you will always win. And that's what I'm trying to teach people with, with that body of work. I got to try to start paying attention to that because I, I, so much of it in my mind has always been, I guess, psychosomatic. I'm like, well, I assume that the brown rice and the lentils, the macrobiotic diet yeah. is something my uncle has been doing for a long time. And so that's kind of spilled over into our family. It's a macrobiotic, but then add some, some lean animal protein. We can tell if it works. It, it's pretty easy. Uh, we get some blood tests. And if your inflammation markers are all low and your hormone levels are where you want them, then it's working. But I'll tell you, and how old are you now? 34. You're 34. Okay. So between 30 and 40, your testosterone levels do this, your stomach acid levels do this, and all sorts of things change. And if you're not getting enough of saturated fat in your diet, for instance, your testosterone levels will start to plummet. And then you get that middle bulge. But it may not happen. I know 65-year-olds who've been on macrobiotic, you know, vegetarian diets forever, and, and they're strong. I just find that for a lot of people, they want to be strong, but they're not actually strong. I was a raw vegan for a while. I've been a vegetarian. Like I've, I've done all these. And, and so this was kind of the careful process of elimination. But I'll send you the one-page infographic. It's like it's a free thing. I just let people download. It's like the guts of the Bulletproof right. Diet. So it's like it's just like find where the food is. Like It's pretty easy. And then figure out, all right, like, am I feeling good on it or not? And then there's my dad who, like, will have just lentil soup and serrano ham and pieces of cheese. And he's 69, and he does yeah. spinning class every day, and he has the body wow. of a 30-year-old, you know? See, you have, you have fortunate genes there. Because okay. a lot of the studies now say it's what your grandmother ate that has the biggest thing. My, my first book about pregnancy and fertility, I really went into that. Yeah. And it's like, look, it, this is another thing that, that so affects people. If your grandmother's in a famine, your chances of diabetes are much higher. Some of the World War II uh, stuff comes out of that as well. Some of the research you talked about earlier with concentration yeah. camps. And you go through all that, but it's less so for the father because it, it's the grandmother's nutrition affected like which, uh, which genes went into the egg that became your mom. Wow. <laughs> and then wow. your mom selected the egg for you based on the environmental conditions at the time of conception. And man, it's wow. complex, and I, we barely know anything about it. But that stuff just yeah. fascinates me all day long. Yeah, I'd love to have a meal with you sometime, dude. Uh, really where are you fun. based? Are you in LA or New York? Guy? I'm in New York. I'm in New York, but oh. I'm actually uh, I'm going to Vancouver for TED. Will you oh. be there? I, I think so. I, I don't have my ticket yet, but okay. I expect to be there. So okay. uh, maybe we can meet there. If not, when you're in Vancouver, let's hook up, and I will have you come over. It's just a float plane ride, about 15 minutes to the labs here and we can play and I'll put you on all sorts of equipment that'll blow your mind. That would be awesome. <laughs> Sweet. Well, I have one more question for you before we finish sure. our interview. Yeah. And the final question is, if someone came to you tomorrow and said, I want to perform better at every single thing in life. So based on everything you've experienced, everything you know, what are the three most important things you have to offer me? Like, what do I need to know? If you want to perform better, at everything mm. you do. So whether, you know, I, I want to be a better athlete or I want to be yeah. a better sleeper, <laughs> I want to be a better at washing dishes, whatever it is you do. Like, like, yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, I, I happen to be very supportive of the decriminalization of cannabis that we've seen in Colorado and, and yeah. increasingly move towards making that happen in California. Um, numerous people that have inspired me, like Carl Sagan and many yeah. others, were very vocal proponents of its uh, spiritual, cognitive uh, benefits. Um, I, you know, I, I've gotten, I would, I would thank a lot of the inspiration, I would credit a lot of the inspiration in my life to, to my past relationship with, with that plant, you know? Um, <laughs> with, with plant so medicine, I, we'll call it. All well, right. look, I think the unexamined yeah. life is not worth living. So I think it's very important for people to challenge their preconceived notions of the world. I don't care if it's by taking up a different hobby. I would say live abroad for a year. I think it'll make you a better person yeah. to be around a different culture and different people. I would say learn a new language. It'll make you more empathetic. It'll make you more creative. It'll make you privy to different POVs, different world views. Um, and, and, and I would encourage people to, to, to experiment in altered states of consciousness responsibly and in a curated fashion, because I think that again there is a humbling, um, there's a humbling quality to realizing that there are other ways of seeing things, and I think that that just I don't know. You come out of those experiences 
a, a kinder, gentler, more compassionate human being. Aside from that, the practical things are get enough rest, get enough sleep, do exercise, eat well, the basics, be yeah. kind, extend yourself to other people, um, and also chase aesthetic arrest. Uh, Experiences that move you to the point of tears, I think, are key. I, I always feel better when I allow myself to be moved by something profoundly. I feel like that's a, a wonderful therapy for me. And that is a that's an awesome list. Thank you. Oh, cool. Awesome. All right. We're going to hook up in person. I'm hopefully going to see you at TED if I can get a ticket for this year. Great. <laughs> if it's not too late. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. Thanks for Brain Games. I think, I think it's a fantastic show uh, for people listening. If you enjoyed this interview, uh, we went all over the place. I, I had a great time. And I think if you watch Brain Games, you'll find more really good stuff like this. So thanks for tuning in on this episode. I'm going to bring you more amazing guys like, like Jason, if I can find them. <laughs> Jason, uh, peace. Thanks, guys. See you so much.